Hello there! Welcome to Mech 2020 Statics and Dynamics Tutorial 1. Today the tutorial topics are Vector Addition and Force Equilibrium. In this tutorial we will cover general properties that describe a vector, rectangular and polar vector descriptions, vector addition operations, force vector properties, Newton's first law and free body diagrams, and force equilibrium. A vector has two main properties, magnitude and direction. The magnitude of the vector indicates the absolute size of the vector or how impactful it will be. With the use of magnitude, we can go from saying the car is moving to the car is moving this fast or this slow. Direction describes where this vector is going in a quantifiable manner. When direction is described, there is almost always a clear reference to base direction from, such as an angle to a horizontal line or another vector. The starting point of the vector is commonly described as the tail, while the end point of the vector is commonly described as the tip. A vector is defined by both the properties above. With these properties, the vectors can be constructed and necessarily defined. There are two main forms of vectors that will be used in this course. The first form, or rectangular form, describes magnitude and direction using the Cartesian coordinate system, as though the vector were translated to the origin. When describing vectors in rectangular form, the vector is often written as x coordinate i plus y coordinate j plus z coordinate k. To represent the vector orientation to the positive axes corresponding to the letter, individually these can be called the x, y, and z components of the vector. The absolute force magnitude can be determined with the Pythagorean theorem of the components and the vector angle can be determined via trigonometric relationships of the components. Polar form vectors have an absolute magnitude, or radius in Math 101 4 terms, and an angle to a given zero degree line or vector. Using trigonometry, the Pythagorean theorem, and the Cartesian coordinate system, it is possible to freely convert between polar and rectangular forms in a simple manner, which will prove useful in a topic later in this tutorial, vector addition. Before vector addition, let's quickly review some useful geometric formulas. The law of cosines and the law of sines describe relationships between the sides of a triangle and its internal angles. Here are some examples of their usage with variations of the same equation. This will become incredibly useful in vector addition as we'll see in its basic laws. Now we will cover the basic laws of vector addition. First is the parallelogram law, which illustrates that all possible ways two vectors can be added together form a parallelogram, with the tails and tips of the vectors forming the vertices. The final sum vector is the diagonal of the parallelogram. Therefore, vector addition follows the commutative property. A useful corollary is the triangle law, which forms a vector triangle of the two vectors to be added and the final summed vector. The law of cosines and sines can be used to great effect if both vectors to be summed are given in polar form. When using the triangle rule, the vectors should be placed tip to tail, or the starting point of one vector is the end point of the other. This prevents negative addition or subtraction of the vectors in question. Now, let's have a simple example of vector addition. Here we have two vectors in the polar form utilizing the horizontal as a reference line for the respective angles. We are asked to graphically show the vector addition with the parallelogram law and the triangle law. Please pause the video for five minutes to attempt this problem on your own. Now that you have attempted to solve this problem, let's go over the approaches. There are two vectors that need to be added together. So first, the parallelogram law has to be drawn for the vectors in question tips and tails included. So I'm just going to make an attempt here. So we formed the parallelogram here. Now we see that the resultant diagonal for the addition of these two vectors is the one that contains point S and points here. For the triangle law, you will get the same result, except everything below this diagonal is not shown here. So if I were to quickly make the model, it would look like this. 
with u here. Now to solve the vinyl vector, we know that the sum of the angles of the first vector, second vector, and the triangle internal angle are equal to 180 degrees to form a horizontal line. Since the first two angles are given, we are left with an internal angle of 80 degrees. We then use the law of cosines to directly solve the magnitude of the final vector, since we have the magnitudes of the other two vectors and the angles between them. To solve the angle with reference to the horizontal, we use the law of sines to find the ratio between the angles and sides and note that angle S is equal to 30 plus alpha, where alpha is the angle of the final vector below the horizontal. Thus, we get our final results shown here. Now we begin the real discussion of this course. The textbook definition of statics is shown here, but for the purposes of this tutorial and this course, the basic equations are more important. The statements that this equations make are the sum of all forces are equal to zero and the sum of all moments are equal to zero. When both these conditions are met, the system is said to be in static equilibrium, which will be covered in more depth in tutorial four. Forces, like all vectors, can be separated into x, y, z components. The other method of vector addition involves summing all the x components, y components, and z components to form the final vector. This method requires both vectors to be in rectangular form before proceeding. The concept of force equilibrium describes a state where the net force is equal to zero in all directions. This concept originates from Newton's first law, which states that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion, without any external forces, will stay in motion. Here we have an example on force addition again, but this time the addition must be done in rectangular form. Please pause the video and take five minutes to attempt this problem yourself. Now that you have attempted this problem yourself, we'll go over our approach. We are given the side lengths of rectangles with a diagonal parallel to the vector given. We use trigonometric ratios to determine the sine and cosine of the diagonal and use this result to find the x and y components of each vector. So for this angle here, alpha, sine alpha is equal to 600 over root 600 squared plus 800 squared. Cosine alpha is equal to 800 over root 600 squared, 800 squared. And then you perform multiplication of the magnitude of the vector onto these angles here and their sine and cosine. We then sum each component in a given direction to find the components of the final vector. The calculation is shown here. The vector angle is found using trigonometric ratios again on the final vector, specifically taking the arc tangent of the tangent ratio of the vector components. Now, let's do a real life example of a resultant force problem. Please pause the video and take five minutes to attempt this problem yourself. Now that you have attempted this problem yourself, we'll go over our approach. In real life force problems, one crucial method to finding a solution is the free body diagram. The free body diagram breaks all the physical aspects of a problem into a simple drawing of force vectors and positions, with all the corresponding values clearly labeled. This method allows you to solve force problems in an organized and clear way, and it is recommended to always draw the free body diagram before doing anything else with the problem. Here we have drawn the free body diagram. Without this free body diagram, overlooking the fact that the tension of ACB acts twice would have been very easy to do. From this, we can construct our force equilibrium equations, assuming that pulley has no moment association. We break the vectors into their rectangular components and sum them to form a final zero vector in accordance with the definition of force equilibrium. The summation of X forces gives us a relationship between forces T and P. From this, we make a substitution into the summation of Y forces to give us a numerical value of T and therefore a numerical value for P. This marks the end of tutorial one of MEC 2020 Statics and Dynamics. 
The topic of the next tutorial will be three-dimensional forces, moment, and moment equilibrium. If you have any additional questions on the content featured here, you may email your course professor or tutorial instructor. Until then, goodbye.